Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Before ordaining, Ajahn Jayasara was named Sean, which in Thai sounds exactly like the word for spoon, Chon. So throughout Thailand, Ajahn Jayasara was known as Ajahn Spoon in some circles. And before he came to Thailand, he made the determination to travel without any money through India, Afghanistan, um, Israel, Iran, working to move through all those places with nothing, just on the goodness of his practice. He wasn't a monk at the time. And it's this beautiful story of surrender. And, you know, he went over the uh, mountains of Afghanistan, rolled up in a rug. He uh, had lost his passport and was wandering the streets of Israel when a um, Family took him in and uh, had him tutor their kids for a few months until he could get his feet back under him. But it also speaks to Ajahn Jayasaro's uh, love of the use of a paramita called aditana, which is determinations. And perhaps the most well-known instance of his aditana was when Longpur Cha had grown paralyzed for the last 10 years of his life. And his health had declined sharply the previous week to the point where all of his attendants thought he would uh, probably pass away in the next few days. And so Ajahn Jayasara, who was at Wat Nanachat at the time, as a gift to his teacher, made the determination to not lie down, to take on the Neshachika practice, which is where you just sleep sitting up, uh, until Longpur Cha had passed away as a final gift. And then Longpur Cha continued to live for another four or five years. And this is a, a classic long port cha. Uh, well, anyways, it made Ajahn Chayasara practice a lot of Aditana those sub sub subsequent five years. And he said that was one of the most uh, difficult five years of his life. He walked Tudong in India without lying down. He um, wrote long port cha's initial biography that way. Um, and it speaks to this quality of heart, determination, one of the paramis. There's the parami of Kanti, uh, patient endurance, forbearance. And one of the other exemplars of this quality, Longpur Pasno, who will be visiting us in June, he had after his fifth rains retreat, when monastics are allowed to finally wander, uh, looked at a map of Thailand and saw the place with the least roads, and it was Kanchanaburi in western Thailand, and he said, that's, that's where I should go. That sounds like good forest. So he went there and spent the rains retreat in uh, a place called Daudam, this untouched, pristine forest with uh, tigers, elephants, and there's many stories from his time there. Uh, one which many of you will know is he was walking meditation one evening and uh, smelt a tiger. They have a very potent smell and uh, it, it was circling his walking path. And there's a sutta called, uh, or a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya where the Buddha speaks about fear arising when he's in the forest. And he said that when that happened, he determined not to change postures until the fear had subsided. This is a good lesson for life when doubt or fear really assails you. Can you just not act on it? Can you maintain trajectory, poise? And so Long Propasano just kept walking meditation as this tiger watched him. And finally, the fear subsided in this faith in the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. And he went up to his little uh, hut porch. His hut was basically bamboo leaves. So he had the impulse to go inside, 
but he thought, well, if the tiger wants to kill me, it's just going to kill me. This wall isn't going to stop it. So he just sat outside in its porch and meditated, and eventually it left. And this is an example of this paramita of forbearance. The woman who was looking after the kitchen at Dowdham at the time uh, thought that Westerners could only eat rice and eggs that, of Thai food. So that's all she fed him for those three months, and he actually went blind. But he didn't say anything because it's long porpasano. Uh, until finally, after a few weeks of not being able to see, he thought, this probably is worth getting checked out. And he went to Bangkok, and they uh, sort of addressed his diet, and he returned. But it's this quality of gratitude, of contentment, of patient forbearance, um, not that anyone has to take it to quite that extreme, but I find these exemplars, on one level you can look at these moments and think, well, maybe it would have been best to go into the hut when the tiger came, uh, even though the hut would have provided scant protection. Maybe it would have been best to uh, immediately go for treatment when the eyesight went, and I wouldn't argue with that necessarily. Uh, or maybe Ajahn Jayasara could have uh, realized that his aditana wasn't meant to last for four years. But when those teachers stick to their word, when they exemplify these qualities of heart so perfectly, it provides landmarks to the rest of us. Many asks, after the Buddha was enlightened, why did he keep keeping ascetic practices? What need did he have for these rules of morality when he was already perfected? And when he was asked why he resorted to forced dwellings, he said, because of a pleasant abiding in the here and now and out of compassion for future generations. Out of compassion for future generations. So these landmarks, these North Stars who embody these qualities so perfectly that you can always remember them, they've given us a gift when Ajahn Chao or Long Propasna was asked what the greatest act of metta, loving kindness, he'd ever witnessed was, he said it was the fact that he felt that after Long Propasna had become paralyzed, he could have let go of his body and died immediately. But he chose to remain in that paralyzed state for 10 years because what it allowed was the Sangha to coalesce around him and adjust to his leaving and where so many senior teachers pass away and their community scattered, his remaining in that state and allowing the community to slowly adjust gave us the cohesive sangha we have today. So, compassion for future generations. These are parmi superheroes, if you will, or exemplars, and they're all around if you really kind of take stock and take note and store those stories for yourself. And we spoke last week about the paramitas, the perfections they're called, these qualities of heart and mind, uh, ethical conduct, sila, or dana, giving, ethical conduct, nekama, renunciation, um, wisdom, energy, uh, patient forbearance, Satcha, truthfulness, aditana, determination, metta, loving kindness, upeka, equipoise. Did I miss one? Maybe, okay, if not. And these qualities, uh, they can be translated as uh, crossings over to the other side, to the other shore, or as perfections. And they're so meaningful because they allow us to broaden our conception of this path beyond just the simple metric of how our meditation went today and if we've touched jhana in our life or not. The Buddha gave us a Noble Eightfold Path and right in Sama Samadhi, right concentration is one of those. But the path is broad and I've seen the alchemy of heart that occurs from people who, who just focus completely on practice and ignore these other aspects versus this broad conception that takes into consideration and emphasizes and values these qualities of love, of patience, of truthfulness, of the paramitas which are growing in the background. And so they're so important to look to.
there's a sutta called the Nava Sutta where the Buddha says that just as a carpenter using an adze, uh, which is a bit like a chisel, would not be able to look at the handle and say, today my fingers wore away this much of the handle, and today my fingers wore away that much. Even so, after a time, he would look and see the imprints of his fingers on that handle. Just so, even though a practitioner may not have the thought, may I attain liberation, if they cultivate the 37 factors of awakening, these qualities of heart uh, that the Buddha lists, um, then the defilements are worn away in them little by little. And what I love so much about that is the chisel, in some sense, it's how we sculpt our lives. These paramitas are the creation of a self, but a wholesome sense of self. And yet as we're chiseling, as we're creating this uh, wholesome, beautiful sense of goodness that our life is aligned with, even so, if we're applying the Four Noble Truths, if we're meditating daily, the sense of self in the background is at the same time fading. You're creating something beautiful with the chisel, but at the same time, that soft touch of the handle is slowly leaving, it's wearing it away. And this is the strange interplay of self and not self in the path. Uh, Ajahn Longta Mahabua, one of the most famous monks in Thailand, said, when you think in terms of ethical conduct and concentration, sila and samadhi, you think in terms of self. When you think in terms of panya, when you think of panya, wisdom, you think all in terms of not self. And awakening is beyond words. Ajahn Jeff notes that in some sense we challenge the Buddha. The Buddha says all things are anicca, impermanent. So we try to create and cultivate a mind which is as stable and unchanging as we can in a bright state. The Buddha says that dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, is wound through all things. And so we try to cultivate a mind which is bright and as pleasant and luminous as possible. The Buddha says that all things are not self, anatta. So we try to cultivate a skill in directing the mind such that we are completely uh, in tune with it and able to steer our thoughts and mind states as we will. And once we've forced ourselves into a corner, once we've challenged the Buddha in that way by pushing each of those factors to their brink, that's when uh, they say the full break occurs and an awakening happens. But all three of those, in some sense, there's a way you're cultivating this beautiful sense of self and at the same time looking towards the place beyond it. So the paramitas, in many ways, they have to do with letting go, but also of creating this wholesome sense of who we are, what our life is aligned with, what kind of person we are in a wholesome sense. The paramita we left off at, the next, which is number five, is Kanti, patient forbearance. And Longpur, this is, uh, the Buddha said this is the supreme incinerator of defilement. And it's such a modest, grounded, grounding quality. It's just making it through uh, what we're going through. Sometimes understanding that we don't have the scope of vision or the wisdom to realize what's working on us. And sometimes all you can do is keep your head down and put one foot in front of the other several, you know, one day at a time until the wave of difficulty or doubt or fear passes. And only then do you act. Often Kanti is just restraining yourself enough not to act from a place of reaction, of dukkha, of doubt, of fear. And the Four Noble Truths are aligned like this or ordered like this, perhaps for a reason, at least there's a resonance we can look to in how they're aligned, where the first noble truth of uh, comprehending suffering is followed by the second of letting go of its source craving. The third, realizing cessation, precedes the fourth of practicing the path. And that's so helpful because what it indicates or can indicate is only from the third noble truth a place of peace 
and calm and clarity does the path become apparent and manifest. So when you're in the throes of dukkha, when there's doubt and fear and a feeling like, I cannot bear this anymore, it's good to know that in that moment, usually, there's some chances where, some situations where you just have to get out of the road, you know, but much of the time, understanding that your whole task is to stay still, to bear with that and not act from a place of craving and suffering. And then you'll find, as, you always, as we always do, that it fades and there is a moment of clarity and spaciousness and then you act from that place of clarity and calm. And that's so helpful to know because the temptation is to try to escape dukkha by reacting, by chasing, by pushing away. And so often Kanti, patient forbearance, is just the restraint to not move, to calm our palsied shaking. Longpur Sumedho translates Kanti as peaceful, co peaceful coexistence with the unwished for, which is quite a good one. And when Longpur Sumedho went to Amravati, uh, several years in, he got a letter from Ajahn Chah. And Ajahn Chah never wrote letters. So he'd had someone translate it and write it for him. And it was his last message to Longpur Sumedha before he became paralyzed. And it said, whenever you encounter dislike, the liked or the disliked, these will be your partners in building parami. The Dhamma is not to be found in moving forward, nor going backwards, nor standing still. Just this Sumedho is your place of non-abiding. So you'd think the last letter would be like, you know, don't do this, make sure you do this. Uh, this is how you should run the monastery. Don't forget what I told you here. But it was this, these two or three sentences. That's what he gave him. And I find that so helpful. Whenever you encounter something that is liked or disliked, these will be your partners in building parami. Because the secret with Kanti is not to conceive of it just as patiently getting through the difficulty, but rather a complete turn towards holding experience with gratitude. Uh, difficulty and dukkha and suffering are how our hearts grow. It's how we develop these paramis. If it's the danger of the deva realms, they say, is they're too comfortable. And uh, middle class, uh, upper middle class America has plenty of parallels with the deva realms. And to know that dukkha is the friction which causes the heart to separate out from the cloth of the world. Can we look not as, at kama as a fist of retributive justice, but as a hand giving us exactly the experience we need to learn? And I know Richard Rohr says his prayer every day is, humble me at least once. Because in that humbling, in that giving up of self, in that what could just be looked on as dukkha or inconvenience, something just to be patiently born through, we find true humility and effacement. Uh, he also says that up until 30, you need a modicum of success to build a wholesome sense of self-esteem. But after 30, everything he's learned has been from failure. So patient endurance and see if you can even switch that to gratitude. But sometimes it's just, you don't quite have the gratitude in you. Sometimes just patient endurance is, is plenty. So peaceful coexistence with the unwished for. The next is energy, virya, whole uh, effort, right effort. Restraining unwholesome states that have not yet arisen from arising. That's weeding the garden. Um, no, it's putting the garden in a raised bed so that it's protected from the surrounding vegetation. Then there's abandoning arisen unwholesome states, and that's weeding the garden. There is bringing into being wholesome states that have not yet arisen, that's planting the garden. And then there's cultivating and nourishing, developing those wholesome states that have arisen, that's watering and fertilizing the plants. This is how we garden uh, our hearts. And 
so much of the path is just about learning right effort. We come and we think that effort means strain. We're so conditioned to think when we apply ourselves, when we give ourselves to the path, it means pushing. But right effort on the path often is much more the effort of turning a key than, than muscling open a door. It is often the effort of not moving, not reacting, and just waiting until there's a moment of clarity and then moving from that place. Right effort on the path is often the effort of just sitting still under the apple tree with your hand open and waiting for the apple to fall into it. Not always. But those recollections are a really useful counterbalance to this idea that we have to push ourselves harder. Have faith in grace. Have faith in this path working at you and on you in ways far deeper than you think. And much of meditation is just a practice in right effort because it's an immediate feedback loop when you are trying to follow the breath with too much effort, when you're being violent to yourself. The meditation goes brittle and sour very quickly, so you immediately can see uh, where effort is strayed. And this is why meditation is so essential towards refining this uh, deeply ingrained pattern of pushing ourselves violently, which we all come to the path with. And just to expect that, like it's very natural, we come to meditation and we berate ourselves when we don't match up to what we wish we were. It's just the pattern that we've been conditioned with. But the path over months and years will wear that away until there's a sense of diligent effortlessness. That's a good word to keep in mind, diligent effortlessness. Often, a sense of grace, of movement, and of also creating a tiered practice where you have certain practices. Sometimes your mind might be scattered and you don't want to sit, but maybe that's the time when you uh, memorize some Dhamma or study some Pali or walk meditation or do some chanting or listen to a Dharma book or listen to a talk. In meditation, maybe sometimes your mind is quite calm and you can come right to one point on the breath but other times you need a more active practice of metta where you're using the mind more. This is all a practice of right effort in aligning our effort with where our mind and hearts are. So virya, effort. The next is sacha, which means truthfulness. Of all the precepts that the bodhisattva in the Jataka tales transgresses when he's moving towards awakening. The one he does not ever break before he was enlightened is the fourth precept of lying. The Bodhisattva, even in the Jataka tales, the tales of the Buddha's prior rebirth, which are probably not canonical, but they're quite beautiful uh, lessons, he never lies. And I think that is so significant because in a sense, we can mess up in so many aspects of our life, but as long as that quality of clear mindfulness of the undistorted mirror is there to reflect back to us exactly what's going on, we can trust that the heart and mindfulness and the path will refine us over time. But the mirror needs to be there undistorted and clear. Sacha. So this aspect of knowing that you are not someone that lies and really uh, taking that uh, seriously, finding, you know, really working to see when you're exaggerating and bringing it back, um, trying to find skillful ways of speaking where you uh, never compromise that basic truth. It's very interesting. They've sort of looking at the long-term life trajectories of uh, habitual liars. Often one of the symptoms that emerges is amnesia, amnesia because you forget who you are. To lie convincingly, you have to convince yourself of something a little bit. You have to distort reality in your mind. And this is why we hold satcha, truthfulness, is absolutely sacred on this path. You have to become skillful at what you say and when you say it. You don't always, you don't always want to comment on your host's cooking, but there are skillful ways of saying, that was really nourishing. I'm so glad to be invited over here. Thank you. 
that's a lovely plant. Have you seen the recent, you know, there's ways of working with this. The next is Aditana. And where Satcha is this truthfulness embodied in the moment, Aditana, which is not spoken about often in Western circles, is determination. It's truth and intention projected into the future. And it is such a useful tool for those who find it to be a useful tool, which is not everyone. But where Longpur Cha says that 50 to 70% of the practice is knowing you should let go of something and not being able to. There's another quote, I think, uh, maybe Long Propasno, that everything I've let go of has had claw marks all over it. <laughs> and, you know, there's a place for that recollection when we can't give up the thing we know is not good for us, of having compassion. And there's a place for Manjushri's sword, of being like, enough is enough. Enough is enough. I'm done drinking. I'm done. Um, or I am, uh, you know, finished with this uh, unwholesome habit in my life. Or, um, you know, or a positive aditana of, I remember when I was in college, I heard about a friend of a friend who was meditating an hour and a half of a day, an hour and a half a day. And something in me just said, I need to find a way to align my, align my life to do that. And I, I didn't always succeed. I wasn't a perfect meditator. But there's this sense of you want to steer your life by those bright moments where you see clearly. And it's not every day that I feel, you know, there's days where as a monk it would be, I feel it would be really nice just to have dinner and watch a movie. And to know that you can determine to, never, to not have that doubt playing in the back of your mind all the time. There's a place, even in those moments where I know when I'm seeing clearly, I know this is the best use of my life personally, not for everyone. And so I'm just going to determine this is what my life will be. And so to make those determinations from those points of clarity and steer your life by those lighthouses it's like when you're in a forest, you take a measurement from one tree to the next to keep straight, or three trees, sorry, in a row, and then you get to the next tree and you take another one, and that way you keep your course straight. You need to align yourself by these landmarks of bright moments, and when you make a determination, um, it's helpful to have a person you tell about it. It's helpful to make it in front of a Buddha image, if you want, and make it formal. It's helpful to give it a test period first, maybe a week. I can't tell you how many, how many people, uh, including myself, have made foolhardy aditons from, uh, you know, and just not realized it quite what we'd said until a week in. So give yourself a test period. But feel free to use this. It's a, a powerful tool, aditana. It's the sword of wisdom. The ninth is metta. We're almost there. And that's loving kindness, benevolence, which most of you know plenty about. But it's called the abodes of, uh, abode of Brahma is the Brahma Viharas. And in the suttas, or in the cosmology, the Brahmas are depicted with four faces. And this idea that metta has four faces, it's benevolence, but then it has karuna, which is how the compassionate heart responds to suffering, compassion. It has mudita, how the compassionate heart or the metta-filled heart responds to uh, seeing another's well-being. It has upeka, equanimity, how the metta-filled heart responds when it needs to step back. And Bhante Nalio gives the analogy of sunlight. Metta is sun at midday. Karuna is sun in the evening, nearing darkness and poignant for it. Mudita is sun at dawn with birdsong and this flush of rising. And upeka, equanimity, which is also the tenth and final parami, is the moon. It doesn't give its own light, but it reflects the light of everything that came before. And this is the beauty of upeka, is people often ask about the difference between upeka and equanimity and indifference. And I think Ajahn Amaro's answer is the most concise. He says, equanimity doesn't have that quality of meh. 
That's your metric. But the fact that equipoise always comes in a list, upeka always comes in a list, because it balances the other qualities. Every Buddhist list has one representative of wisdom. And the Brahma Viharas, upeka, equanimity, is the representative of wisdom. It's knowing when we need to step back, but it's still colored and touched and flavored by all the qualities that came before. It's the moon that reflects that light. And it's waiting for a moment when you can make a difference. It's not wasting your energy on something or a situation that is not amenable. The etymology of upeka means to look closely. Upa means to approach and ik means to look. And the best analogy I have for this is, or, or the best example is when I uh, am with certain uh, family members, not present company excluded, my parents are here. <laughs> um, I know over the course of three or four days, there's going to be some cars flying around left and right. And my entire job is to stand back and not get hit by them. You know, the family might get into debates about first wave and second wave feminism. Um, it might get into debates about uh, baby boomers and Trump and Biden. Your job is just to not get hit but to continue to watch closely because I find in those three or four days, there will be two or three moments where I'll find myself sitting across the table from this family member with a cup of coffee in our hands alone, and there's just a chance to touch each other's hearts. And if you'd gotten caught up in the tangle, then you lose that chance. So on the surface, equipoise, equanimity, upeka can seem indifferent, but in reality, it's the greatest compassion because it's framing and directing all those other motions of metta. It's the grandmother's love. It's letting people make their own mistakes and acknowledging and honoring them with their own agency. So these are the 10 uh, paramis. And, you know, just really wanting to emphasize that as people practice this pattern of thinking we're not good enough, of always feeling like our practice is not up to what the person in the Q&A seems to be indicating their practice is up to, it's like the emperor's new clothes and everyone is wearing, I don't know how to finish that sentence or analogy, <laughs> not wearing them, wearing them. But it's only necessary for that kind of veneer to be maintained when we have this narrow, constricted vision of what practice is. If you're coming to these gatherings, if you're opening your house to people, if you're giving, if you're cultivating patience, if you're studying and listening to teachings, if you're living with right view and morality, which are the two qualities Ajahn Shah emphasized again and again, something will happen in your heart and is happening. And don't devalue that. This path is potent, beautiful, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. And it's a blessing to walk it all with you. So, sadhu. Han dhamayang dhamakathaya sadhu karang kathamase sadhu, sadhu, sadhu anumodhami So we have a Q&A time. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand and speak. If you've spoken over the last three or so sessions, I'd ask that you hold back your question and allow the quieter folks to sort of chime in. Uh, Cheryl. Hi. I, um, <clears throat> I want to, I, I loved your talk, um, and, and it reminds me that sometimes I forget to do any of that, <laughs> and that I have a real issue with patience. Patience is my, is my, uh, is the ball and chain that I carry around me. Impatience, I should say. <laughs> and I want to apologize to Sid, if he is still here, <laughs> for being so task oriented this morning. Because I, I find that when there's a time constraint or, or a time, you know, and I'm, and I'm doing setup or whatever, that's when my patience tends to fall away. So I'm just 
Put it out there. <laughs> Thank the big you. Sadhu to Cheryl. Okay. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. And um, this is where the vinya is very helpful, and this is a part of the vinya that the lay people can take on is the conditions for admonishment. I've spoken to them very frequently, but just to sort of list them again. Um, before a monastic can admonish another monastic, there's a variety of things, criteria that have to be met, but some of the most important include um, speaking at the right time, the right place, speaking from a mind of loving kindness and asking permission. And I just find you have no choice to be, but to be patient if you literally cannot give admonishment without meeting those criteria. So it, it's a really helpful firewall. Um, and Cheryl, you're, you're wonderful, but uh, this isn't about you, but I think it's, it, that's a useful metric for enforcing that patience and realizing that often the issue doesn't have to be addressed right, right now when we're activated. Trenton, please. My dad. So I'm not sure quite how to formulate this, but um, I mean, a really standard way of looking at Aditan is like you make sort of a, a really formal, I'm going to do this. Is there, um, do, do you look at sort of um, another softer version as sort of Aditan of the heart? Um, I'm going to try and be calm. I'm going to, anyways. Great question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Yeah, I think one can just make a, you know, kind of intention um, towards something. And, you know, whatever an aditan is, it's what you want to make it. So if you're like, you know, I'm going to bow to the Buddha and make this formal intention to really try to control my anger, then, you know, you could call it an aditana. But if what you're really talking about in your heart is this trajectory, then that, I think, is how you can hold it. I will say, like, people just have different relationships with aditana. For some people, it's just not a useful term. Like, it's much better to be soft, to sort of um, trust themselves, uh, just to kind of navigate more fluidly. It feels too harsh, too kind of rigid. Um, and then there's others, and I'm one of these, who use it all the time um, in little and small things. Uh, you know, um, what books you're going to read or not going to read. Uh, when you're going to check your email, when you're not. Um, and those are obviously like little, little aditanas that aren't big, but then that can extend to quite large determinations. So with the small things, I think they can be held much softer or you can kind of have uh, ways of changing them when it's not useful to have them in place. Um, uh, but yes, I think there has to be a place for a much softer approach because that's how a lot of people work better. I have something to add on Aditana as coming from Thailand. It has um, a nuance of also, it has a nuance of faith and of asking the Buddha or the goodness to help you to accomplish what you are asking for or what you intend to do. So there is that element of you know, the goodness helping carrying you, uh, you through this. That's really good, Kate. Yeah, the word aditana, like if you go up to a Kruba Ajahn in Thailand and say, would you aditan the barami of Guanyin? Uh, you can ask the Savajan Anand, he'll, you know, what that means is kind of, can you resonate or call on that enlightened mind or, or that luminous mind and bring it here, manifest? And I do have faith that some teachers can do that. Um, and the convergence between those two uses of the term is really fascinating, you're right, because when you're aditoning something very wholesome and simple and aligned with your true path, in some sense you're aligning yourself with, with the Dhamma in a way that gives you profound strength. The Buddha said that a benefit of sila is you approach any assembly unconfused. No, you approach any assembly without fear and you die unconfused. And when he spoke about the um, the, the aditanas or the determinations to hold the five precepts during the uposa today, he said, one should recollect just for one day, let me live like the noble ones live without taking life. Just for one day, 
let me live like the noble ones live without stealing, and so on. So this is explicit alignment with the bright, luminous chitta. It's a really good point. Yeah. Please, zoom. I think you're muted. Can you give some strategies for generating right energy? Recollection of death is a very common one. Um, just recollecting how precious this hum human life is. Uh, the Buddha has a sutta called Future Dangers, where he says there's these future dangers. One should recollect, uh, right now I'm young, but in the future I might be old and it is hard to practice. Let me apply myself now. Right now, society is peaceful, but in the future, war may break society open. I can practice now, let me practice now. Um, there's another sutta uh, where he talks about the grounds for laziness and energy. And he says, one person may think, uh, I did not get much alms food today, I'm tired. I will rest. Whereas another, uh, and, or that person might think, I got too much alms food today and my belly is full. I will sleep and rest. Or that person may think, I have a journey to go on. I should rest before I go on the journey. Or a person may think, I just went on a journey. I should rest after that journey. <laughs> These are the grounds of laziness. And then there's the grounds of diligence where one reflects, I did not get much alms food today. My body is light and buoyant. I should practice. I got too much alms, or a lot of alms food today. I have energy to practice. One should think, I am going on a journey. When journeying, it is hard to practice. I should apply myself now. Or having just coming back, come back from a journey, one should think, when I was traveling, I did not get to practice as I would like. I should practice now. So this way of shifting our perception is very useful. Um, in practical terms, I also find uh, cold showers are very helpful. Um, Exercise is really important. I, I find I need to exercise somehow before I meditate or else it's just not very useful. Um, listening to Dhamma talks is just essential. There's per periods of my day where meditating in silence is not the best uh, practice for me, but listening to a talk actually really allows that space to be held. So those are all really good things and meditating with others can be quite helpful too. Did that uh, help? Or I guess it's in the chat, so it's hard to... We'll just assume it helped. I'm sorry if it didn't. Tai Chi. Tai Chi is beneficial, yes. Qigong and Tai Chi are great. We do have to wrap stuff up. Oh.